Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to theCUBE's continuing coverage of SuperCloud 5, the battle for AI supremacy. Lisa Martin here with Savannah Peterson, live in Palo Alto, but as you know, because you've been watching us over the last couple of days, we've got crews on the ground in Las Vegas at AWS reInvent, John Furrier, Dave Vellante there, having some amazing conversations. You're going to get more of that today. We also have Rob and Rebecca at HPE Discover in Barcelona. We are giving you a canon of Cube content, but we've been having great time the last couple of days talking with loads of guests, different vendors, partners. Savannah, we've been talking about that the battle for AI supremacy isn't really a battle, it's all about collaboration. Yeah, I would say that it's a collective, you know, instead of, I mean, it feels like a sprint right now, but everyone's got to get across the finish line. Yes. It, it seems like uh, a bit of a, a rally race, you know, a four by four. People are handing off different Ooh, batons like of race. the process. Just came up with that one. Uh, on the fly on the here, fly. you heard it first, folks. <laughs> but I, I do think that that's what it's going to take. It's going to take different players. It's not just going to be that one star Absolutely. sprinter that comes out. There's going to be a lot of parts and components of this. Many of those components and pieces we've discussed guest here and had his lovely guests on the show. Yes, and we're very excited to welcome back a more than 10 timer to the Cube, Dave Donatello, VIP. CEO of Riverbed. Dave, it's great to have you back. Welcome. Great to be here. Great to see you guys. So we've been we've been talking a lot about customer experiences, employee experiences, digital experiences, so incredibly important for businesses across any organization, but it's not easy for organizations to deliver that truly seamless digital experience that we demand. Why is that? Well, it's getting harder every day, right? And, and it's part of what we're discussing here. We're going to discuss AI. It's yet another change to the IT environment. Over the last several years, we've seen everybody, you know, work in the office, to work from home, to work from the beach and Starbucks and everything else. So the more complexity you add, the more difficult it is to deliver seamlessly for IT departments, and that's what they face. And with that complexity, you know, I believe you're going to need more automation to, to make it work for everybody. One note I'd add on that is, you know, we recently did a survey, 10 different countries, and 68% of millennials said they would leave their company based on a bad digital experience. 68%. Yeah. 68%, that's yeah. over two thirds. 63% believe that their company really would suffer, you know, if they offer a bad digital experience to customers. Think about it, right? In, yeah. in your own yeah. life. Absolutely. Yeah. If you're online and you're buying something, you don't get a good experience, you go somewhere else. Absolutely. Let's step back just for a second. It, it's obviously fluent in our lexicon, but the digital employee experience, DEX, what does that actually mean? Can you define that end to end? Everybody defines it very differently. <laughs> I, mean, so I had a hunch that that might be the case. So I, I mean, what I'd say in general, it is, do you have a seamless experience? And I can give you all kinds of different examples of this from- I mean, I have a food delivery app, a seamless experience. Well, Kidding. let me give you one you might not think about, doctors. Oh. Mm. Okay, so just a very non-traditional one. We work with a bunch of hospitals, a uh, hospital who I know very well, and we, we talked about, uh, talk with the riverbed. They were losing in, in one hospital 900 doctor hours a month due to their inability for their endpoints, like if your laptop there, yeah. to work properly. Oh my gosh, that's and insane. If, and if you think about it, doctors are oh my not- my gosh, that feels so preventable. Well, yes. Exactly, and, and that's yeah. kind of, we help them solve that problem. Amazing. But think about the ramifications for that problem. There is definitely a medical shortage post COVID. Yeah. yeah. Right? People can't get appointments. They're, they're stretching out. And so 900 doctor hours a month, if you think about appointment wise, say an appointment's 30 minutes, that's 1800 appointments in a hospital that can't get done. Second issue around that that they had is that they want to go to digital medical records, right? For all the benefits of those. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? If your endpoint's not working, you can't do your yeah. digital no. medical record. Doesn't right? matter where it's stored. You're back to paper, exactly. Yeah. So in our case, we're- Physical on-prem at yeah. that point. Yeah. yeah. Able to use automation to reduce that down to 200 hours a month. Okay, so that's 1,400 doctor visits a month you get back by offering a good digital experience. Wow. Okay, so that's, that's a medical wins. example. I can I give you that, that across every different industry. Every, exactly, but, that, but what, I love the healthcare examples because it affects everybody. We were talking about that Absolutely. yesterday. Absolutely. And it's life and death. Absolutely. Bottom line, life and death. Yeah, it is. So that's a really beautiful and compelling example. How, we, we talked a bit as you were getting settled today about the customer service experience. Like you said, nobody wants to call a customer service center. I feel like, I mean, I'm actually procrastinating probably three of these phone calls myself right now. Uh, and so how does automation, I think when people think about AI, one of the, the big fears and anxiety comes around it taking jobs away. Right. How does AI change this experience as we know it when it comes to customer service? 
Um, I think dramatically. It, yeah. And I can give you a couple examples. Um, first, at the highest level, right? The best customer call center is no customer call center. Yes. And that, that really gets to automation resolving problems so you, you don't have to call anybody. Uh, you know, we were joking before, right? If, again, if you look at your endpoint here, who wants to call the help desk? My answer is nobody. Right. No. <sighs> right? Because we know delayed, you're waiting, you just want to do your job. Mm -hmm. So in the idea of AI, uh, you know, we have products today at Riverbed as an example that can understand either while something's happening or, or in many cases before what your issue is, use data and actually real data, not synthetic data, to, to understand what that problem is. Use something we call a run book to actually automatic, mm -hmm. in an automated way fix that for you. So no call, everything's resolved, and it's also tracked so the people who do kind of look at these things holistically can understand, hey, something happened there, it was resolved, this is exactly what it was. So I understand that Riverbed has shifted the business towards the observability market. I want to understand, Dave, from your perspective, what, why observability plays such a key role in the success of AI? Very simple, and, and, it, and, it's, and it's interesting, I've heard a lot from your other guests, right, over this, this course, and in the best way to think about, in my opinion, to have good AI and good machine learning, because both are sort of coupled, depending on how you want to define things, it's all about data, right? You have to mm -hmm. train yes. your machine to actually do what you want it to do. And, and you've heard a lot, I think, over your, your last few days here, and certainly they're talking about it out at, at a lot of the various shows, is you know, synthetic data can lead to a lot of issues. Mm -hmm. and, and what we do and what helps with, around digital experiences we collect data from all different points. Okay, we collect network data, we collect application data, we collect data how you interact with your cloud, we collect data how your endpoints are working. Are you collecting data on us right now? Uh, we could be if you want our products, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the idea behind that is real data, not synthetic data. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're dealing with real data, you actually can train machines to actually have great accuracy in terms of what they do. I gave you an example how we can fix things in an automated way today. And so, to me, data is the center of all this. Mm -hmm. yeah. in, in, in my career, which has spanned a, a bunch of different technologies in our industry, it always comes back to data mm -hmm. and having accurate data, and more importantly for companies, having the ability to actually understand what their data is yes. and then how to action it. Yes. And so again, to get the business benefit that people are really looking for AI, this is going to be the key. We're going to be talking about this a lot. You mentioned your career, which is quite impressive. One of the other dialogues that we had to start off the day was that it has spanned the pre-internet business world and now the obviously post-internet, mid-internet business world. Do you think we're going through one of those transitions again? Absolutely. And I, and I would say, I, I think for, you know, I, I have kids, so I always use my kids as my internal focus group. If you talk to them and say things like, you know, pre-internet, they look at me like, what? Yeah. <laughs> but. But I worked, you know, in the in the technology industry before the internet was here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and you mean that industry existed? It, it, it was an industry. <laughs> we, actually, we actually, in the dark ages, had computers. I've read stories. And all, exactly. <laughs> so, um, but if you look at it, from, again, from a big business perspective, what happened was mm -hmm. a whole bunch of new winners emerged, and we know who they are, right? Everybody from Google to Facebook to, um, you know, Airbnb, whoever you want to talk yeah. about, Uber, these are all companies that were enabled by the internet age. A whole bunch of companies, went away because mm -hmm. they couldn't adapt. You know, famously Blockbuster, many oh, all, you know yes. regular retailers who were only brick and mortar. Right. World changed. And then a lot of big companies who were around um, were able to adapt successfully and become even more successful than ever before. You know, simply put, if you look at companies like UPS, FedEx, Walmart, they are bigger than they ever were and they successfully adapted to the internet world. Yeah. AI is that discussion now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you're on a board and I'm on a board, right, the first thing that happens with the CEO, you ask him a couple questions. One, how are we not going to be put out of business by AI? Mm -hmm. And again, regardless of industry, regardless of anything you do, that CEO, I guarantee you, is getting that question asked. Second question I'm going to ask the, the CEO is, how are we going to use AI within our company to become more competitive, more efficient, to be one of the winners in this space? Mm -hmm. And then I think the third thing, Aside from that CEO, is there's a whole bunch of startups, as you know, because you talk to them all the time, saying, hey, we're going to be one of these new players who emerges out of this yeah. and, and become part of the new economy going forward. It's one of those moments. Again, the internet, I was, it was really exciting to live through mm -hmm. and see all the innovation that happened and everything that went, went on with that. And I believe this is every bit as powerful uh, a change in our industry. When you're talking with 
CIOs, CEOs, what are some of the, how do you talk to them about making the right investments in cloud, in AI, and, and other emerging technologies as we, as we enter almost 2024? What are some of those recommendations that you have? Yeah, I, I, I'd say, I, I think there's different ways to look at it, right? On the technology side, because you, you know, I'm proudly work on new products and everything else, in our industry in general, you know, everybody wants to talk about leading edge, leading edge, leading edge, which is great, because that's what we do. When you get to the business side of things, what they really want to talk about is what can I practically do? So meaning, and in, in, in it's, in it's a big lesson, I think, for all companies, whatever you're shipping has to work. Yes. And it has to provide a business value that people can measure and say, look, I can make my, I mean, we talk about digital experience here, I can make either my customers or the folks who work here experience measurably better by implementing this, right? This makes sense. And, and so, as you know, our whole industry, I love the whole idea of the hype cycle and the trough of disillusionment. And Gartner gave us a gift with that yeah, one. Yeah, because yeah. it's true. Mm -hmm. It is. And, and so, clearly, we've gone through a huge AI hype cycle, and now it's down to who can deliver practical solutions at work. Right. And the good news is products are out there today, yeah. right? You, yeah. you, see, you see a lot of co-pilot type products mm -hmm. that pro provide real value. They definitely work. People see, okay, this makes sense. Yeah. We have a product um, called Alluvio IQ that does some of the things we were talking about. It's real, you can implement it today. Mm -hmm. And that's what people want to see is how do I make things better and don't just sell me hype. Yeah. You mentioned Alluvio um, recently went to market with that. What's the strategy behind that approach and how is it going to enable those organizations that have been struggling to deliver that seamless digital experience actually achieve it? Yeah, I think, I think one of the big things that isn't talked about, and, and you see this again every time we get to one of these new trends in IT is you can't find enough people to understand these things. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so a lot of people want to pretend though. <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> but, it, but in our industry, right, what are we seeing? Shortage, can't hire enough AI engineers, yeah. can't build fast enough because people don't have yes. enough skills. Yes. Okay. Well, the same thing happens, you know, we're talking about, hey, it's difficult to deliver these experiences. Why? Because they can't hire enough smart people who understand each of the intricacies of these things. Mm -hmm. So that's where automation comes in. Yeah. And, and the whole idea I mentioned, data collection. So how do you collect the data that normally a human would be looking at? Yeah. Get into a way that a machine can, can handle that and understand that. And that's kind of what our products do today. It's that easy button we've been talking about on the show. Yeah. Exactly. That developer productivity, what can you bounce off of from now? Well, it's the whole idea of you know, using automation to augment yeah. And, and I think, you know, the other like thing. Like a trampoline. Yeah, you know, well, you hear other people say they're worried about, well, job replacement, all this other yeah. stuff. In the tech world, there's plenty of jobs. Absolutely. And there's plenty to do. Yes. What, what people are bogged down with is a lot of noise. And mm -hmm. if That's you look, point. You, so when we talk about co-piloting and we talk about augmentation, the idea is, okay, look, we'll take away a lot of this drudgery mm -hmm. that you kind of had to spend your time on. And now go focus yeah. on the real problems where you want to use your brain on. The cool stuff. Exactly. The 20% of the things that you wanted to be spending your day on. That you can't. Anyway, right. or at least, you know, to some degree, uh, a bit more. You mentioned the hype curve. Where do you think we are off at on that little baby right now? Well, I think it depends what we're talking about. That, that's why I mentioned practical solutions. I, I mm -hmm. you know, for. For businesses, it's what can I do now that mm -hmm. makes sense? Right. And then architecturally, what do I need to start to plan for? Yeah. And so I'd say most businesses are kind of in that phase now. Architecturally are more, you know, dramatic type changes mm -hmm. that will play out over years. They don't happen as fast as everybody says they do in, in many cases. And then the practical so solutions like co-piloting, piloting, as we spoke about, they're doing that stuff now. Yeah. So, um, so we're in and we're in an implementation phase, but we're in the early, as I like to say, always the early innings of this dramatic change. What a diplomatic answer when it comes to the curve. I love it. Uh, <laughs> we got introduced to a very fun term on the cube with uh, one of our guests on Tuesday. Vaughn told us about fofu fear of effing up, which is a bit of a conversation that he's having in the C-suite right now to, as, as folks map out their strategy for AI, is that an experience that you're having? Do you, in, in some of your conversations, are people anxious, are they excited, equal parts both? Well, I think, I think equal, equal parts both is the best way to say it. I think anytime mm -hmm. we've had these big changes, um, you know, the human reaction in many cases is fear. Right, yes. right, yes. right. Yeah. And, and typically, you know, what they, what they don't really say is they'll talk about fear of all these things, but it's ultimately fear for themselves. Right. And what I mean by fear for themselves is how do I fit into this new world? You know, are my skill set, is my skill set still relevant? That type of thing. 
And I think that's just human nature that we see. And, yeah. and then, you know, the leaders kind of get past that and get into, hey, it's safe over here and we can go implement and, and look at the great changes uh, that happen with that. And, and so that's kind of one of the fears I see. I don't, and, and the other fear I see is the, you know, the overused word of disruption. Is am I missing something here that's going to come back and really bite my, mm -hmm. you know, business? And and fear of missing out or fear of I'm late to the game are, yeah. are big fears. Yeah, yeah, FOMO is real. It is real. The FOMO, the FOMO, the fofu. <laughs> <laughs> when when you think about the future of the observability market and its potential for growth, what does that look like? And, and as we are today, the the one year birthday, as you brought up, uh, mm -hmm. Chat GPT. Right. How has this injection of Gen AI in the last twelve months? How is it going to influence or impact the observability market? Yeah, here's what I'd say: is right now, as I mentioned, complexity is a real problem. Yeah. So I was talking, I was speaking with a customer the other day. They're using fifty eight products in observability today. Fifty eight. Whoa. Okay. Now think about that for a second, right? How many different suppliers you have to go deal with? how you have to, the burdens on the customer to try and knit all this stuff together in order to really understand what's happening. So the, so yeah. the mega trend we see there, I mean, we see lots of mega trends. One I mentioned, real data, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Big trend has to happen. Second big trend um, that you really see customers desire, desiring is fewer suppliers to cover more of the space. I need fewer, you know, speaking to the voice of the customer, I need fewer tools yeah. to help me deal with this because I can't stitch 58 things together. It's just, it's just way too complex for me. So um, that really is a trend, and I think you're going to see that continue to play out in our space, which is more consolidation and people wanting to cover more of their environment um, is very, very important to our customers. I think the other thing I'd say is agent proliferation. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, go ask a customer, hey, show of hands, how many people want to load another agent? This gets kind of wonky. I know it's a little technical, but it's important. And if you talk to, most of these products run on agents is the idea. And if you talk to some big customers on, on a device like you have right here, they're loading 18. That's a lot. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so now I got to keep those updated. I got to make sure there's no security issues and go on and on and on. Right. So it's consolidation of product, consolidation of agents, give me more data. And that's why, you know, in our case, Riverbed, we're doing everything based on platforms now. Mm. Okay. <clears throat> single agent, single place to keep all your data make it simple and cover everything from networks to uh, endpoints to applications. Getting, oh, oh, go for it. I was gonna say, getting rid of that complexity is so key because as yes. emerging technologies become more widely adopted, the complexity, the potential for complexity sprawl exactly. is real and organizations cannot survive. We talked about you know, the, the call center, the fact that the, the mm -hmm. best call center is no call center. We don't, we don't want to call, but if we have a bad digital experience, we churn. We go somewhere else. Right. So really, well, to be fair to call centers, if I can add, if, if, if you do have to have one, you know, most of these are going virtual now, which yes. is right call center from your house. In, a, in, you know, the technology itself now, we can understand, do you have load time issues? You know, meaning so your mm -hmm. customer data is either coming up slow so that person can't respond. Yeah. Or uh, the agent, the call agent isn't following things in the order they should. All kinds of different measurements you can do, even though the person's at their house, yeah. to understand what's the efficiency of that call center how do you get to the answer that people want faster? And we, we found that to be incredibly popular because most companies have some form of yes. call center one yes. way or another. I always think employee experience, customer experience like this. They're they totally have linked. to be absolutely linked, inextricably so. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. For, for that digital experience to be successful and deliver what, what the end user is looking for, the employee experience has to be dialed in and seamless. Yeah, and I'll, I'll give you a fun fact from uh, our survey because we, we're all out here in Silicon Valley. So the, you know, the, the trifecta in Silicon Valley is give me merch, give me free food, and give me happy hour, right? Those are like three big <laughs> pretty good employee trifecta. benefits, right? That's a trifecta. The thrills of the Silicon Valley. Exactly, if you live here. In the Valley, uh, actually, above all those, internal digital experience was ranked higher. Wow. It could be shocking to the people who live out here, right? That they'll give up the, the, the triple in order just to get that. <laughs> they'll give <laughs> They'll give up a manufactured social life to have and a really free high food. Quality I mean, one. that's a big give. Hey, up. And, yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah. But it just I, shows that the impact. I mean, is profound. Yeah, yeah, and I think generationally, it, it, you know, the, the tolerance level goes way down. Oh, 
Oh, 100%. yeah. I mean, yeah. well, you know, that's been another one of our themes on the show is once you have once you have a different experience, you don't want to go back to the poor experience. No. Once you've used Grok, you don't want to use a slower no. uh, AI. No. It's just a reality. Right. It's like driving yeah. a, uh, a Porsche and then going back to your old Toyota. It's just not the same. No, oh, that's not an experience I want to have. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I want to go the other we, way. We were talking about cars last night <laughs> after the show. Uh, so, so question for you, because you, you obviously see a lot of different applications, a lot of different tools, like you said, different, uh, and, and you're talking about platforms, agents, the whole shebang. The theme of the show is battle for AI supremacy. Are you seeing a lot of, do you, do you have some clear front runners? Do you think it's still a bit of a grab bag in terms of where the chips are gonna fall, say in a year from now? So my personal view is this, is because this is so data dependent as we discussed, mm -hmm. it's been very, very difficult in, in the history of our industry, and I've worked my whole career around data, to have one mega data player. Mm. It's, you know, think about data lakes and all this stuff. Everybody yeah. talked about that. Most of those projects failed. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Why? Because it's really challenging. Yeah. yeah. It's not that, you know, this is very difficult stuff to do. So, yeah. so if you think about that in that context, what I believe is going to play out is, you know, to my earlier theme of practical solutions people can actually see business impact from, is you're going to have multiple winners who specialize in an area of data that you know they can actually manage and get real results out of mm -hmm. versus saying we're going to have some uber you know data container that will solve all things for all people i think in the short term that's just not practical in the short term you have to go for things that actually work and mm -hmm. things that will work are going to be although very large you know in this context of what i'm explaining smaller yeah. data sets that are more focused on specific areas and then over time, like I said, if we figure that out, as we do, and I'm confident that we will, yeah, then there's a chance to have more data consolidation and solve more problems, which to your answer would be more, uh, uh, more of a singular winner who can cover more of the marketplace. Interesting. And then the, the other thing I'd say is, is, look, if you see the market already today, you'll, just like we talked about in the internet, we're going to have some of our tech yeah. companies who have always flourished, who are going to adopt to this and do well. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to have um, new entrants who's no one, no one had ever heard of even today. Yeah. yeah. Who all some become household names. Yeah, definitely. As you look into the future, the near future is 2024. What are some of the top priorities that you're going to advise CIOs really start paying attention to? Well, I mean, I think, I think you have some of the same old, same old, and then you have things that are, are changing, um, you know, fairly rapidly. In our case, on the same old, same old, we just talked a lot about digital experience, right? That this is a problem that is not solved. And it is getting more and more attention to it every day uh, for that reason. Uh, security forever. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, right? That gets challenge, more challenging every single day out there. And I, I, you know, we talked about board level discussions. That is certainly mm -hmm. a board level discussion. And... You know, the problems are getting so severe now, you see really significant company damage on some of these bre uh, oh, absolutely. breaches now, yes. which is yeah. really a shame, right? No one wants to see that, but it's no. just a reality where we live. It is. Yeah. And then offensively, as we talked about, um, you know, people want to invest in AI. People want to be more competitive and people want to grow. And yeah. that's a pretty good, I think, priority list these days for people. That's great advice. Dave, thank you so much for coming on SuperCloud 5, the battle for AI supremacy, sharing with us what Riverbed is doing to help organizations on the, the DEX front, why that's so challenging, but also how Riverbed is helping them tackle those challenges. Give some great examples of, in healthcare, but I know this goes across every industry. We so appreciate your time. Thank you. Great to be here. Great to thank be with you. you. All right. In a moment, John Ferrier and Dave Vellante talk with CEO of Aviatrix, Doug Merritt. Stick around.